So the current economic shock has taught us anything. It is that despite all the new controls, rules, regulations put in by Congress after the financial crisis, Wall Street has, shall we say, a way of finding new and inventive ways of creating things to sell. And like the hundreds of billions of dollars in subprime mortgage-backed securities that basically broke bank balance sheets more than 10 years ago, a similar, but simpler, Wall Street product needs to be on your radar if it's not already. You've probably heard about them. They're called CLOs, Collateralized Loan Obligations. No, not CDOs. Those are collateralized debt obligations, which of course just, you know, helped destroy the banking system in 2008. CLOs are bundles of business loans generally made to smaller or mid-sized companies, some of whom have maybe troubled balance sheets or have maxed out their own borrowing, can't sell bonds directly to investors, or do not qualify for traditional bank loans. There are some key differences than CDOs, the biggest of which, and they're important, is that there are no mortgages in them, and there are none of the dangerous credit default swaps, remember those, built into those products. Now, the market for these CLOs, they have boomed in the past decade. The loan market is now valued at more than $750 billion at the end of 2018, with some estimates pegging the number of CLO markets, because there are leverage used, at $1.2 trillion most priced in U.S. dollars. But while this market may have survived relatively unscathed pre-pandemic, the current crisis has exposed its weak points and, according to our next guest, could lead to a crisis bigger and more serious than what we saw in 2008. How's that for an introduction? Joining us now is UC Berkeley School of Law professor Frank Partnoy, who detailed this new major risk in the current issue of The Atlantic, the looming bank collapse. It has been one of their most read stories for about a week, and it should be, and by the way, one of the top five business books I've ever read it was written by that gentleman called The Match King. Frank, it's a pleasure to get you back on nice and early from California. Thank you. It's an important topic. How Thanks less so much. It's risky, great to see you. Or more risky uh, are CLOs, how much more or more less risky are CLOs than CDOs? Well, it really depends on the time. So back in 2007, 2008, CLOs weren't risky at all. We weren't worried about these businesses all defaulting simultaneously. We were worried about subprime mortgages defaulting simultaneously. Right now in the pandemic, we have a lot of businesses that are troubled that are very likely to default. And so today, CLOs are the more dangerous. How much, and your article noted, as of annual filings or quarterly filings, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, and Citibank had, if my numbers are right, about 70 to 80 billion on their balance sheets. AIG had a few billion more. How much do you think is out there ultimately across the bank balance sheet spectrum? I think your numbers are about right in aggregate, and we know that there's certainly more than 100 billion of CLOs at banks. And the Fed has done a study that essentially said that. We also know that there are about 100 billion or so of CLOs that are unaccounted for, where we can't find them. And we're getting lots of surprises on CLOs. So JP Morgan announced that it had lost $2 billion, an unrealized loss on CLOs. Basically, nobody even noticed that that had happened. And Wells Fargo recently announced that it had $7.7 .7 billion of what are called loan form CLOs that were a surprise to many people. So these are big numbers. We're talking about for those three banks. We're talking about significant numbers. And it's not they're not the kind of numbers that will bring the bank down on their own. But they are uh, numbers that should cause us concern when coupled with other kinds of losses that banks inevitably are going to have in the next quarter and beyond this year. You lose your phone, you hit a button, it starts beeping. I don't know how $100 billion in a Wall Street product just goes missing. Maybe we need to find my CLO thing. Either way, Frank, let's move on. Okay, here is the problem with 2007. We're going to get a history lesson. As we know, everything was sort of stacked together. Triple A, single A, double B, B, C, like a Jenga game, of course, famous from the movie The Big Short. And the bottom went bad, and so the whole thing collapsed. Are CLOs, the ones at least that you have seen, are they structured the same way as the risk still in that sort of, you know, small percentage at the bottom, but kind of holding everything up? Yes, the basic idea is the same. So you have underlying credits, the loans themselves that are rated single B or triple C. 15% of them are triple C, about two thirds are single B. So those underlying loans are risky loans. But the idea is that when you package them, that the top part of the CLO should be low risk in the same way the top part of the CDO 
was thought to be low risk in 2007. Now, the problem is if a lot of these loans all default at the same time, the way subprime mortgages all defaulted at the same time, then even those top layers, the layers that are rated AAA or AA, can become at risk. So in late March, we know that the AAA layers were seriously at risk, and there were major concerns about the pricing of those AAA layers. The Fed has intervened, and so we yeah. had support psychologically in the market. But many people are worried that the losses that are increasing in the future will start to eat into those AAA and AA layers. And that's a critically important distinction because we're not here to terrify people at 550 in the morning, 250 your time, Frank. The problem with 2007 is eight, as we now know, looking in hindsight, was that nobody, not many people anyway, <clears throat> saw it coming and they didn't act in time to save those mortgages that went bad, thus crashing everything down. All these Fed programs are really hard to keep track of, even for people who track them for a living. Do you think the Fed has gotten out enough ahead of this because of what we learned 12 years ago? Certainly the Fed has been very quick and they've learned that it's important to really impact the psychology of markets. So that's what they did in response to late March. And that's what they're doing now. That's what they did yesterday with a new program that was announced for secondary lending. Also, it's interesting to note the Fed said after all the bad news last week that it's going to start examining banks more. It had said it wouldn't be doing that. So the Fed obviously is concerned and they're getting ahead. They're being quick. Um, and it's a lot of money. But one of the other important things to recognize is that the Fed isn't buying everything. The Fed can't buy every piece of debt that's out there. And Dodd-Frank, the legislation after the last financial crisis, restricted the Fed. So the Fed isn't able to buy investments in insolvent institutions. It's not supposed to prop up banks. So it has restrictions, and it's not supposed to rely on credit ratings. But if you look at the term sheets that the Fed is putting out now very, very frequently, including yesterday, they are relying on credit ratings. And so there's a lot of uncertainty about these Fed programs. We'll hear from the chair uh, today and tomorrow, and he very well may be addressing some of this uncertainty about these yeah. programs. You, you think the credit rating agencies are going to get it right this time? We screwed it up last time. Big time. Right. And you, you were very prescient in that and criticizing the credit rating agencies. And unfortunately, some of the same kinds of models Thank that you. were used then are being used now today. So same kinds of concerns today with respect to what supposedly is a AAA rating.